Hello? Harry. Yeah. It's Steve Balderson. How are you? I'm pretty good. Steven. Yes. You want to talk about the murder in Wamego? Well. <laughs> <laughs> My God, honey, do you know how long ago that was? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> And you think my memory at this age is okay? <laughs> when this happened, I was working in the, at the Wamego Drugstore. And Glenn Stewart was one of the guys, you know, that dug him up. I think it was Christmas 1993 when Stephen was home for Christmas from CalArts. And uh, we began talking about the... Uh, the true story around which Firecracker was created. And uh, Stephen had never heard the story before and he asked about it and he became intrigued. And then uh, after he finished Pep Squad and began to work, talk about his next project, Firecracker was always the one that he wanted to do next. We talked about whether to do Firecracker instead of Pep Squad, but, but the, both he and I concluded that he really needed to get a film under his belt uh, and, and Pep Squad was one that, while black comedy is difficult, it, it, it was, uh, would have been an easier one, a more appropriate one to do first. Mark. You all think you are so great. Well, you are wrong, all of you. Marker. I have plenty already. She's a fist of steel crowned with an ostentatious temple. Super mega shaja oh. sprang forth full blown. story now about a 23 year old local man who makes good he directed his own movie and it'll be shown at the Cannes festival that begins this week in france kmbc's laura mort shows us why the movie pep squad will strike a chord among students in the midwest get the body in the car and hurry up i've got a geometry test tomorrow the movie Pep Squad magnifies high school conflicts and issues a metaphorical dark comedy with two storylines congratulations the first one is about these three kids who kidnap their high school principal in order to make change in their school because he's a molester and he's a horrible person. And the message is that you can't sit around forever before making up a decision to follow your dreams and that if you don't follow your dreams, you're going to die. <laughs> The entire film was shot in the Wamigo, Manhattan area. Pep Squad might test your stomach and your nerves. Steve's exact intentions. Steve spent about a half million dollars on the film. It'll be shown at the Cannes Festival in France sometime this week. Quite an accomplishment. Steve says Pep Squad can also be a commentary on a sleepy Midwestern town that awakens with a jolt as its teenagers start to run wild. This picture says it all. The main character, who's played by Balderson's sister, crowns herself homecoming queen with a burning American flag as a backdrop. Of course, she kills off the other nominees first. And the fact that no one comes with open arms and says, come on, follow your dream, go and move to a different country and uh, move to a different city, make a film, live on the edge, and blah, blah, blah. You know, they don't say that. They just say, well, why aren't you going to K-State and why aren't you playing football? <laughs> I come from a family that over many generations has had family economic endeavors. Uh, the business that we had that we sold to Caterpillar um, was started in 1930 uh, from a blacksmith shop that my grandfather and his father owned. Um, my great-grandfather was a blacksmith with his father. So, so in our family it's pretty common for multi-generations to be in business together. and. It was pretty clear to me that Stephen, when he began making video movies at age eight or nine, <laughs> wasn't going to be in the, in, the, in the steel fabrication business. So uh, as he began saying, I want to make films, and this is after, after school, I, I, I want to make a, a, my movie, will you help me? 
it was, sure, that's a stretch in terms of, of the, the technical knowledge, but it's, you know, my answer to him was, if we can do it with a business-like um, mode of operation, if we can have a business plan and, and we, we conduct ourselves in a business-like fashion, I'd, I'd love to work with you. And that's what we did with Pep Squad. Uh, it's what we've done with Firecracker. Here's the key. There isn't any money in LA. There isn't any money from the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's gonna finance a film made in Kansan, Kansas by a bunch of Kansans. So we've had to figure out how to do that ourselves. So it's, it's pretty damn low budget. Mm -hmm. we, we looked at Pep Squad and we said, okay, this thing is good production values. Uh, it's got uh, great cinematography. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and in addition to that, we had comfortable housing. We had yeah, great food. It was a good production. It was a, it, it was a good experience. It was safe. It was comfortable. Yeah. And so we said, can we make Firecracker like that? Can we replicate what we did with, with Pep Squad, mm -hmm. with the Firecracker script? And we've taken it apart piece by piece, and the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so that's the plan, and it, and it becomes a very low-budget, uh, independent motion picture. When I'm casting a movie, what I like to do first is go through a bunch of magazines until I pick people who visually look like what I need them to look like in the movie. So um, it doesn't matter who it is. Then what I do is, if those people are celebrities, I try to reach them on the phone, personally. Um, it's hard to do, but you can do it. If I'm going to spend six days a week for six weeks with someone, I need to know that this is somebody who I can work with and interact with. You know, how will we get along and all that stuff, because it'd be miserable otherwise. So <clears throat> that's how I do casting. I don't have auditions. I don't like people doing monologues for things that I'm not directing. I don't want to see someone do the best Hamlet in the world, because you know, I want to know how they're going to play the roles in my movie. Um, well, actually, what happened was, I guess a few years ago, Stephen was looking for somebody to fill the Harriet role. And um, so Pleasant, who I was already friends with, um, suggested me for the part. And so Steve called me, and we hit it off splendidly on the phone. I totally loved him, and I found his laughter to be totally... Uh, great and infectious. So I loved what he had to say about the story and when he sent me the script I read it right away and I thought it was brilliant and I felt that the script had um, all the elements of a project I would love to work on. It was dark and funny and beautiful and full of a lot of intensity and I really really liked that and I really liked my character so I said yes as soon as I read the script because I just loved it so much. When I first met Steve, we, we connected immediately. We just we had really similar sense of humor. Our, our minds seemed like they worked in the same way. We, we just got each other. A long time ago, he, he, he started telling me about Firecracker, and then he was showing me like the, the storyboards and everything that he'd made for the original presentation. And uh, this, the story just fascinated me. It was amazing. And I've been obsessed with circuses and carnivals and oddities and just weird tangled stories, the kind of stories that, that are sort of uh, illuminating the human condition and centered on a few characters but have a universal kind of appeal. And Firecracker had all of that. And just Steve's whole vision is so complete, his artistic vision. It is just completely focused. He knows exactly what he wants. He knows exactly what he wants it to look like. He knows what sort of people he wants in the character roles. I first got a hold of Karen Black through my friend Lloyd Kaufman, and she read the script. And originally she turned me down, and she said, I don't know if I could physically live through this. So after that, I went on with um, casting somebody else in the part. The first person I approached was Madonna, and her uh, record company guy, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but uh, clearly didn't put us in contact, so that went nowhere. Um, I sent tons of stuff to Jodie Foster's people, 
Uh, they seemed to be somewhat nice at the beginning. I got the feeling that it wasn't going to pan out either, <clears throat> so I didn't continue with that. Um, I wanted Debbie Harry for the part after that, and I sent this stuff to her manager in L.A., and he called me back and said, Debbie doesn't do movies like Firecracker. And I thought, oh, all right. In the meantime, James Russo had come on board. He was having dinner with Debbie Harry and was telling her about the movie. She was really intrigued and called me up and pretty much said she'd do it before she even read the script. Hi, Steve. This is Debbie Harry calling. I got the book and the pictures and the schedule and everything looks great. Um, I look forward to reading the book. I'm going to take it with me. Thanks a lot and lots of love. Bye-bye. Then I called, or I told her about what happened with her manager. I told Debbie um, what he'd said to me. And the next day he called and apologized. By that point, Karen had taken the role of Sandra, so I didn't have anything else for Debbie to do. But Debbie really wanted to be in it, so Debbie said, well, how about I play Ed? Debbie came on, and then uh, Dennis Hopper came on as Frank. And when that happened, the movie had snowballed out of what I'd originally wanted. Originally, I wanted uh, the dual roles of David and Frank and Sandra and Eleanor to be played by the same actors. And when all these celebrities started coming on board, I was disillusioned with fame and fortune and all of the, you know, sort of numb hypno hypnosis that comes along with Hollywood and bright lights. I lost sight of what this film was and what my original vision was. So for quite a while, I denied my vision because of these people, because I thought for some reason that they would bring the success of the movie. I realized slowly that that wasn't going to happen, that I needed to make this movie the way it was supposed to be made. And when I came to that realization, I said to myself, Mike Patton has to play both David and Frank, and Karen Black has to play both Sandra and Eleanor. If I do that, I have to throw away all these celebrities that wanted to be in the movie. Debbie, actually, wasn't affected by that because she was playing Ed, but then her music manager suggested that she focus more on her new record coming out. She decided to walk away from the movie. And then I moved Susan into the role of Ed. And in hindsight, I'm glad that I did that because Susan was incredible. You know, I had the opportunity to get to know him before making this movie, not necessarily personally. I only met him personally once because we live you know, across the country from each other. But um, I talked to him a lot on the phone, and he'd send me his storyboards. He works so incredibly visually, and, and the storyboards really explained his, his commitment to the project and his understanding. And he really has, like, a really distinct vision of how this story should be told. And, you know, part of your job as an actor is to, you know, first and foremost understand who you're playing, but there's a whole element of it is, is that fitting fitting who you believe you're playing into the director's vision. But it, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating. It's, it's a very distinct way of storytelling. And um, in some ways I found it incredibly liberating because you just thought, well, this is the way he sees it, so how can I make this work? Uh, this is Bill Tresh in New York for Steve Balderson. I represent Sissy Spacek, if you'd like me to talk to you, thank you. When Dennis Hopper was on board and I could not do the dual role idea, I knew I had to find someone else to play the mother. So then I sent it to Sissy Spacek. When she read it, she had him call me and say that she didn't want to do the mother because she'd played so many mothers recently, but she really wanted to play Sandra, that she was addicted to it, but she didn't know if she had the courage to do it. And I thought, well, that's a very strange answer. <clears throat> I mean, maybe it, it is bare bones, you know, this part, but I never thought, I mean, I would think if I was gonna be in a movie, I would want to scream and holler and rant and rave and do fun things. You know, playing the guy next door may not be that, you know, fun. Again, it didn't matter anyway because Karen was supposed to play both parts. So regardless of the people that I approached, Sally Kirkland was actually cast as Eleanor for a while. Um, and when I sent Sally her letter explaining that she couldn't do it because I needed to stay true to my original vision, I think it shocked her a great deal, but um, I had to be true to myself. I mean, if there was one point in my life that I needed to be selfish because it mattered, it would have been now. I did contact Kathy Bates. She uh, would have been great, but again, wasn't supposed to happen. 
her management actually, they were somewhat helpful, but in the, in the strangest sense, they were really rude. And they would say things that, you know, were ridiculous, like I needed to put a down payment, you know, before I could even, before she'd even read the script, you know, that I needed to offer some money. And, and I thought, well, that's like buying a car without taking a test drive. It's just stupid. So I didn't do it. Once we then finally figured out, okay, we're probably not going to go the route of a Hollywood producer, the budget started being cut in half and cut in half again and cut in half again. And, and finally it became such that the only place we could make it probably was here because since we're from here, we knew the secrets of how to do things for not as much money. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, to rent a, I, th I may get the terminology wrong here, to rent a shot maker dolly would cost four or five thousand dollars. We figured out how to make one for maybe 250 and put it on a, a trailer that we borrowed from a local farmer. I am not a puppet nor a fucking number. I am Cherry. And if you can't handle it, get the fuck out of my way! We went back to Pep Squad and how it was structured and put together, how it was made. And I said, you know, we can make this that way. We can easily make Firecracker the same way. And this coming, mind you, from days before when we had this huge Hollywood, you know, fame and fortune just hypnotizing us like a drug. Then to come back to the other end of the spectrum and say, every dollar's our last and we have to do every single part ourselves and, and make this possible. Going from one extreme to the other was very exciting. It, was, it wasn't scary because it was, it was familiar. For the record, this one is already split. I didn't break it. All right. that's interesting about independent film is you don't have the finances to hire everything done. You can't call up somebody and say, build me a wagon, hire your 30 contractors and, you know, let's buy off brand new cedar and whatever. Yeah. So we had to get donated materials, free materials, uh, recycled materials. We had to go to the junkyards and search and build these things ourselves. Sex research. What's that? See that book? Oh my God! And I'm, I was going to send that to Pleasant. <laughs> Looking back, I think my, one of my favorite experiences on this entire film was building those wagons. It was peaceful, it was calm, there wasn't a lot of people helping. Um, there was Sean, the AD, and my dad, and my sister, and my brother, and uh, a couple of PAs every now and again. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> the Baldersons? Well, the only Balderson I knew was Steve. I had no idea about this family. Steve was also in the process of building uh, uh, sets, um, uh, basically wagons that were going to be used in the carnival. Uh, so I told him, I said, hey, listen, if you need help doing this, how many people do you have? Do you need help whatsoever? And he said, well, it's just me. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, he's going to definitely need other people. So I volunteered my time to go down there and help him. Harriet's wagon was the first one. We started in March. Hers was a recycled hay wagon that we drilled through the steel base and, and took the floor out and then made the structure on the sides. 
so the wagon, you know, had some sort of support. And it was miniature, because Harriet is a little person, so everything was a little bit smaller than a typical gypsy wagon, more to her scale. When I wasn't doing something with the movie, I mean, shit, we tried to put this thing together for almost five years, so being able to build these gypsy wagons was like freeing space in my brain. Like when you take your computer, you know, to, you make discs to clear off your computer and then you, you know, defragment. I felt by making these gypsy wagons, I was defragmenting my brain because there was all this stuff just stuck at the back of my face. <laughs> it was horrible. But, you know, so I didn't want to stop. Like once we started building it, I didn't want to sit down again until October when we were finished shooting. And I don't think I did. I enjoy working with my son. Uh, we, we get along good. Uh, and so it's, it's been a labor of love, and, and we've had great fun doing it. The second one we built, I think, was the Enigmas. And his was actually going to be a set piece. So one of the walls had to be removed, and it, it comes off the side. And uh, it had to be fully finished inside. So his actual wagon is not a facade. It's a, it's a real gypsy wagon. After we finished the Enigma's wagon, we went to the Frenchman's wagon. His wagon is more traditional as far as the siding that we chose and the design that we came up with. The huge mammoth wagon for Sandra's trailer, which I call a trailer, I mean it's not really a wagon, uh, it could easily be a single family home, took quite a bit, but the base of it was donated to us by a trailer maker and we fashioned this very unusual design that looks somewhat like a bullet, somehow managed to make it work. Towards the end, it was getting a little frustrating because there are so many arches, and Sandra's trailer is a geometrical nightmare because you've got these 45 degree angles, and then on top of that, it's curving. There's, the sides aren't like this, it's, it's round, impossible to do anything with. But we finally finished and, and got it done, like, you know, a few weeks before we started shooting. There's an article in this yesterday's Kansas City Star about this new film company in Kansas City. Anyway, they're going to make five $200,000 films. How are they doing it? It's got on digital. And nowadays the video is better quality. So it's it's so it costs five thousand dollars, and okay. that's it. Okay. Because they, it, the article says they can shoot, it's co and they call it digital film, yeah. which, what's that mean? That means it's digital, is, film is film, film is film, and this digital is digital film. Is, digital. Is, yeah, is, video. And they're usually, because well, I know a couple guys who've done straight to video films that have shot on mini DV or shot HD, and then it just goes straight to right. straight to video, and they just skip the whole film process. So then they said, but the camera, cam the cost of cameras has come way down. In fact, they can get the, the camera they need for 3500 yeah. So it's got to be like the one that you have. Exactly, like the one we have. Okay, that just explains it. Well, it irritates me so because he quoted, you know, he said Blair Witch Project was shot for $30,000 and paid $240 million. Right. But isn't the truth it was closer to 400000 by the time they finished it? In well, the yeah. Film? Yeah, the sound design, yeah. Well, it's in El Mirage. I mean, it, there's... It's, it was shot for that, and then the studios pick it up. And if you minus everything else, the actual price of filming on the film, the actual negative photo photography is what? That's what they mean. It's just mar it's marketing. So then we could just say we shot Firecracker for 67000 <laughs> <laughs> Which is ridiculous. I, just, I mean, I thought, I, I thought that was it, but I just was sort of surprised I reading the like article. I don't like the people that say, like, digital film. They, they confuse people well, into believing it's film, but it's not. It's a video. It's a video. Well, what they're doing is, quite frankly, this was on the business pages. And they're looking now for investors. Oh, and course. what they're doing is they're deceiving, it seems to me like. They're just deceiving I'm, people with money. I think you think you're investing in a movie and what you're going to get is a video. Actually, I met Steve through a fellow instructor that he had at CalArts that I had at Art Center. It was definitely an experience. Was, I grew up in Iowa, so the idea of coming back to Kansas was a, the closest I thought I was going to get to shooting in Iowa. So, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think Pep Squad would have, and I'm sure other people will be able to tell you better on this, but I, I think it would have done a lot better had Columbine not happened. I saw all this momentum 
building and building, and it seemed like, you know, everything was working out as planned, and then Columbine happened, and from my perspective, that was sort of the, that was like the end of Pep Squad. He's not bogged down with the Hollywood mentality of, there's a certain amount of freedom that he has here. I mean, the way Steve, Steve works, there's not a lot of, I mean, he's got a, he's got a vision. I mean, there's, and it's, it's his vision. I mean, and there's all the rest of us that come in here. We're, we're just help, helping execute his vision. If we can just get on film what he has in his head, he'll be happy. And he's got it all in his head. There's, not, there's nothing that's, I mean, if you look through his notes, there's nothing that's left out. You know, it's not, there's very little to be interpreted. <laughs> there's the Balderson way and there's the other way. So. Back to the whole difference of Kansas and Hollywood, like that's another thing that's good about um, him being here is that he's really able to focus every day. Rhett shot Pep Squad, and the way he and I work is incredible. I, I don't know how to explain it other than there's a weird psychic connection that takes very little communication in order for it to be exactly what I want. So always I wanted him to be the cinematographer for Firecracker. And he was on board for five years until two weeks before we were to shoot the Prairie Fires. Uh, I learned that his wife would be giving birth like the third week of our shoot in September. It was a huge blow, but at the same time I knew how important that was for him. So we quickly had to find someone else. And I looked through Jonah's reel. Jonah had also gone to Art Center, had the same exact education that Rhett has, and surprisingly they're a lot alike. And working with them is, is very, very similar in some aspects. I think Rhett was a little bit less afraid to take risks and would just sort of, you know, create a spur of the moment, have fun with things. Jonah came on literally the week before we needed to shoot the fires. Rhett left, sort of in a weird way. Some guy he was working with who was maybe going to be our production manager, I can't even remember his name, they just sort of abandoned us. And the fires were going to be out, like in ten days. You know, and they, they only burned the prairies... <laughs> they only burn the earth once a year here. I know that sounds weird, but um, we only had like 10 days to get it, and then it was going to be gone, and we would have to wait until April of next year to get it. Luckily, we found Jonah when we did, and they came out, and Jerry was with him, and we were going to talk to Jerry about being our production manager, and we went out to Wabunsi County and captured the fire footage, and that was the culmination of... Five years of waiting for me. So that single moment out there on the prairie watching that fire burn, there was no turning back. And it felt incredible. Nobody was secure in the cast. We had nothing. But I knew we were making the film. It was just great. Yeah, maybe we should go see what that one is and maybe we can pick either one. So I was telling him, half hour, 45 minutes from now, I think this fire will be coming up this hill and it'll gain some intensity coming up hill, too. Okay, good. Yeah, it'll get work when it comes up hill, fire goes up, it works better. So maybe if we get over this barbed wire fence. It's... Um, yeah, if, if it's possible for us to drive up here. So this way you set up, we throw it in, you know, and then we can get out of here. To like where we're standing, sort of. I mean, at the top of this first little yep. right there. Yeah. And then from over there might be all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it looked like, it looked like this, what, everything on the side of the fence is burning. Pretty easily. Might Whatever be you want. Get a little pissed off about that. I don't know. Well, but over here, they. Thanks. I brought four extra packs, and water and snacks. I am craft services today. Oh really? Uh -huh. <laughs> How close is the fire? <laughs> Tell it to wait a minute. Where's it going to be? Right. 
well, this is not fun and games. <laughs> no, no, We're I here to do it. some I work. I that was a bit interesting trade. Oh, I know. <laughs> the audience will feel like they're going someplace. <laughs> but if we put it right to left, in film theory, it says that they're going back in time. Okay. As like moving backwards versus forwards. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. I really like that over there. There's... Posterity? Yeah. <laughs> Wait for that truck to go by. Okay. I want you to count every second to like eight. But we're gonna practice. Should we run through the pan once? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. And go. Whenever you're rolling. Okay. So you. Okay. We can hear it. And then we can go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we stop and we just hear that for ten minutes. Right? That's it. Okay, if I go a little bit long, that's okay, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. All right. Now let's talk yep. while we're waiting for a light. Yep. It's not gonna go whoosh. <laughs> if it does. Like the forest fires we were in last year in Colorado, it's not gonna do that. I would rather Yeah, 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 yeah. Steve, okay, so a telecine had been made from that, and he showed it to me. Right. And it, it basically was the, the movie. No music. Right. No sound effects. Right. So that was about 290. Okay. Our premise has been, what, what, what we've got is, we've got a firm commitment of 300. I don't have money laying around in the bank. I've mm -hmm. got to invest it. I've got to... Sure. In various things, uh, you know, some of it's in the stock market, big deal. But, you know, I could go borrow the difference. I'm not going to go sell anything sure. to do it. But that's another one of the contingent paths. Mm -hmm. So we've got several c possible paths to right. total completion. That's probably the worst case scenario. I'll do it if I have to. Right. I'm that committed. I mean, I'm committed to doing it, if, okay. if that's what it comes to. I don't think it'll come to that. So it's like, in my mind, we're, we're going to finish the thing. I just am not sure which path. This is the red curtain? Yeah. Okay. So he'll be hiding behind this. 10 by 10 square. Yeah. And there's so many different setups. Mm -hmm. Like, somebody would essentially just walk in and do it, you know, a lot of different things with just one shot because it's so small. Yeah. But I like the impact of having it be all split up. And seeing different sides of stuff going on in all different directions. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I'm going to get a lamp for my dad's mm -hmm. that has a black shade so that we could do some stuff like that where it's just this nice... And it's going to throw that pattern up out of the top of the lamp too. Yeah. And this is the one that we, we talked about where the roof might be that, that right. domed roof that might be raisable. Right. <laughs> it's like, I think it's 874 a week. But, but basically what we're offering is 1000 a week to the SAG people. Then plus deferred. And plus, deferred. plus uh, share of the producer's interest or whatever that's called. Don't they call it points, but yeah. it's just a percentage of of the producer's of share. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, it, to be it's it's probably pretty easy to overlight something like that because it's a small area. So you'd probably want to, I mean, light it to your eye, and then meter it and pull everything back to where it's gonna look right. You know. Mm -hmm. 
we just need to make a list of what like base each light bulb is, you know, if it's a, a standard light bulb or if it's going to be a smaller one. You mean like a candle bulb or whatever? E yeah, like a candelabra bulb or whatever. We're going to need, because that's going to be part of the kit that we bring, is going to be having varieties of different things to use. You just got to realize that a lot of our orientation to this is that that the, the stereotypical movie magic LA way of making films has a lot of people in positions that my job is to do this and I work about three hours a day and the rest of the day I don't do anything. Um, now there's some that that's not true of. Sure. They need to have some experience, some understanding sure. of what they're doing. I mean, make make some notes on ones that we need to ask him to. Okay, tell tell me about that. You know, um, again, it's based upon our experience. So I let him share at a little bit more detail level why he has this sense that. I mean, I can understand that your experience with that one might have been a bad one, but um, it's just quite simply you could have just gotten. A bad script super, you know what I mean? But I think there's also a sense that maybe the script super could be the second AD. The trick was to deprogram the people from LA into thinking differently about how to make a movie. To make a film with my family in this town under our circumstances, on our terms, for my vision, requires a lot of things to be changed from the way that you're taught in a film school or specifically in the LA industry. So project number one was to deconstruct some of the traditional ways of movie making and yet offer new ideas on how we could do the same thing for less. I mean, again, I'm gonna go back to our experience was we were told we had to have somebody who's done this before and knows what they're doing. So we got somebody who'd done it before, had a resume, had a reel, yada, 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 and they were awful. And it, when we found the person from Crumbs Beauty School, they were terrific. The lesson is, and, and I'll say it repeatedly, you don't have to live in L.A. to make a movie. True. You know, but, but a lot of people that live in L.A. that make movies think you have to be from L.A. to mm -hmm. make movies. Sure. Like, like, like it's brain surgery, you know, and mm -hmm. if I, had, I haven't graduated. But, you know, there's people that if I haven't graduated from Harvard Medical School, I'm not qualified but to But there might be somebody that's, that is that is time and time again proven to be excellent that lives in L.A. that will do it for that price. And that could be, absolutely. And so, we're, I'm, we're not opposed to that. Okay. Create those things when we're going to do the faux carnival. Yeah. You know, so that, that'll be perfect, actually. We'll yeah. just have to, you know, plan for those things, you know. Because all the research would be just there for us. It'll be there for us, yeah. The tent. Inside the whole tent, the next time we see her is her Garden of Eden performance where she sings that song, and it's real vivid, yeah. real saturated, mm -hmm. and she's much more blown out than she is. Mm -hmm. but she's got a lot of olive in her skin. Mm -hmm. And that's lit, you know, pretty high key as well, so um, we got to keep that in mind, you know, wherever she's going to be doing that song, we want to make sure that we have her away from the background and we can light the background as a separate layer the way we want to. Yeah. And then maybe even have a, a middle layer of something else sweeping like a, like a, you know, a wrap of some sort. And then maybe even, you know, then we have her in the foreground and we have to stack it that way. Okay. So each one is lit, you know, because I think in the script yeah. it has the copper trees right next to her. Well, that drawing, I have to be used because um, Roman knew he needed X, fill in the blank, whatever X was, mm -hmm. and, and he just went and bought it. And if it had called me out, it would have said, hey, did you know that? Sure. You know. Um, and I can give you an example of it right here in my house. All right. Follow me. We're going in my house. This is the kitchen door. And we're going to go down the basement. Here in Womego, we have a uh, sort of an area theater, a uh, live performing arts theater that attracts people from all over northeast Kansas. This happens to be their costume shop. You need a costume? Just come on down. Don't go buy it. Right. We can just get it here. 
My whole role in this was to uh, first be a personal trainer and to, to get Jack in shape and also be in shape for, you know, whatever other different scenes that come up because there are some nude scenes. Well, when I first met Jack, um, I went to his parents' house and I uh, got to meet him. Nice kid. Uh, uh, talked to the parents, told them, you know, I was very serious about this and that I was uh, basically going to, you know, devote my time to help him get get in shape, get where he needs to be. He was really easy to get along with, Jack was. And so we set up times through the week. I told him uh, we needed to change the, the, the meal plan, not necessarily a diet plan, it's just a matter of eating better. He's a high school kid. Most high school kids and college kids, they don't eat good. As we started to, to work out, it, the first couple of weeks were fine, uh, but I noticed that he didn't listen to to what I had given him as far as eating right. The very first day, he went to the gym. We're working out. 10 minutes in the workout, he turns completely pale. Then he almost passes out. He starts sweating. And then I'm asking him, I said, I told you on the phone, I said, if you're not eating properly like I told you, I will know. He's not my babysitter. Right there on the floor as he's laying on his back, he's telling me, I didn't eat right today. And I said, well, no kidding. start filming at 6 in the morning and it is like 11 to 12 o'clock at night so he's gonna have to get used to getting up early and then preparing himself throughout the day so that's why I want him to start now because what the first shoot starts at the end of June now so the carnival shoot so we went through three different co-producers with, with this film every time we got close to moving forward with these people the various different companies they all turned rotten for some reason, they just they weren't right. So we walked away from every single one of them. The last one <clears throat> was this man who wanted to recast the whole movie and said Edward Furlong wanted to play Jimmy because he thought it could win him an Oscar. And I thought, great, fine, wonderful. You know, when you got Ed Furlong, you got a fucking movie. So can I tell people? Hmm? Can I tell people that he's in? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just got off the phone with his agent. The thing is, now with that furlong on board, mm -hmm. we get our fucking, you know, we can get either a Carrie Ann Moss or a Famke Jansen or a Lena Olin. I mean, it's like a no-brainer to get them now. And he finally offered me money for the script and said that he had Gus Van Sant ready to direct if I would simply sell him my story and walk away. And I took my movie because I'm not a writer, I'm a director. And I needed to show it first and foremost how it was supposed to be shown. So in that process, it was a little unclear to me what to do with Edward Furlong, because I hadn't put him on board. This man did. Uh, that very week, he was dropped from T3 for alleged substance abuse. When I contacted his agent and asked to be put in touch with him, his agent refused to put us in contact, and I never understood why. Like, I just thought it was really rude. I thought, well, if I'm going to be directing this person for six weeks in Walmigo, I at least should talk to them. This, it goes against my rules of how I do casting in a movie. He didn't like me saying all those things to him. So, you know, we left it at that. So I knew I had to look someplace else and just leave it alone. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should just start looking at unknown actors, you know, young, actual 17-year-olds. It just so happened that I came across this kid who was an actor in Topeka. I saw his picture and I knew right away it was him. I knew it was Jimmy. I had him do somewhat of a screen test, though what I basically did was just put the camera up and let him behave as Jimmy without any direction, just sort of improv. And I was blown away. Uh, and that was Jack. This is gonna sound pretty arrogant. I don't mean it arrogant. But I think like a lot of things, like a lot of industries, like a lot of walks of life, the people in them, in order to make themselves feel better, make it out as how what they do is, oh, so difficult. Oh, it's so specialized. Oh, it's so unique. Mm -hmm. yeah, how, is it that unique? I mean, sure, there's elements of being in the, in the construction equipment business. There's elements of being in the movie business. There's elements of being a doctor. For God's sakes, I've got to have the education. But, you know, getting your payroll out, getting your self-organized, hiring, firing, picking good people. So it does not intimidate me. 
you know, the idea of making a movie doesn't intimidate me. We've hired some people. We know we need to have some people. But we need to hire someone to supervise and coordinate and manage what we're calling the art department. Hair, <clears throat> makeup, props, set. Steven's already designed it all, and most of it's already been executed. It's somebody to organize it and manage it, coordinate it, make sure it's where it needs to be on time. It's the very definition of what a theatrical stage manager does. So we've got a lot of people in this part of the country who have been, educate, been educated in stage management. But, oh no, we have to have somebody from the movie business because had no way possibly could a stage manager understand what needs to be done. Excuse me a minute, the phone's ringing. Hello, this is Clark. Uh, I, I knew this girl named Arian Chapman who had just graduated from Juilliard and I thought, in stage management, and I thought, damn, that's exactly what we need. Arian was great, and when she came on, we were damn near finished with, I think, the third Gypsy Wagon, so she was able to help do the last couple, and it was a lot of fun, and we built the sideshow sets and finished the banners. I loved painting the sideshow banners. I mean, it was pretty straightforward, but it was a lot of fun, too, because it was sort of just paint my number, and we would lay them out on the ground, and, and so, it was, you know, here, Sean, take the red. Here, Jack, take the yellow, and then just go around to all the banners and paint just that color mm -hmm. and all the stuff. So it was assembly. The Sideshow Assembly Art Department. <laughs> and whatever we do on there, we need to do the same on that one. Friend of this is Jack. Hey, Jack. Hi. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I loved having anyone come and paint banners. I think it was pretty important to have young people in this community realize that they could be creative and have an outlet for it. Because typically in small Midwestern towns, you don't hear a lot about people supporting the arts as much as you do sports and, and stuff like that. So it was just interesting to see how many people came up that had a great talent that could, you know, just have a a lot of fun painting. It's very, it's very involving. It's very, there's a lot to do. There's no question about that. The average guy sitting in a movie theater, watching a movie, cannot begin to comprehend the amount of detail, the amount of complexity, the degree of complexity that is present in a motion picture. I mean, whatever you think it is sitting there, it's like about ten times that. So. It's not his website. No, that's the IMDb. You know, different Harry's still on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a disclaimer on the Dekanga site that we do not endorse the IMDb. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Because anybody can get on there and put incorrect yeah. information. And by small, I mean really small. Population, 4,200. Physical size, about a mile square. So our primary plan regarding dressing rooms is to simply move actors back and forth between the location and their lodging, which in about 90% of the scenes will be less than a mile away. That's roughly accurate. I mean, that's not... It doesn't make me any more comfortable, though. Like... What? Having a makeup thing and how... Or, or even, like, a couple blocks away. Like, what if you want her touched up in between Oh, no, the but scenes? they just take they just take a bag and they just do it on the lawn. Okay. They don't okay. get a mirror in, like, a room and stuff. Okay. Well... You realize, though, if you're doing that, you're kind of not shooting yourself in the foot, but you're cutting it so close with what you can do with the makeup that... They don't need a room to do it. No, but if you had a, a vehicle, it could suffice mainly as uh, we need five minutes for an office. It's raining. we got to get folks inside. Right, and if we can get one for free, great. Anything we can get for free is great. But anything that costs more than $10, I have to put my foot down and say tough. So well, well, at least we've got to challenge all of those. Well, or just, yeah, yeah and, and Yeah, because there's a reason to have one. And the reason is it's an office. It's a, it's a dressing room. It's a, 
I need five minutes for this scene because it's an important, heavy emotional scene. You need to talk right. to the actor to get away. It's a privacy space. It's a place where you can go, I need ten minutes to work on this scene. It's many, many things. Ten dollar commercial yeah. to a one day video. Like right. I can't see a production with that one. Because but, but see, that's I, right. That's one of the three I, vehicles that shows up on a location to me. If know? I were gonna work with somebody, I'd just take me to the kitchen. Or but don't you see that you're dealing with folks that actually have worked before and they but, but they might tell you that I, they're going to enjoy that, but I they want might such not. a rapport with them that I could yell at them, and they respect me. Uh -huh. Because we've you talked about every... You know what changes, though? Once, once, once the movie starts set, like, we see it happen too many times. You know, I'm sure you've heard the stories you probably had on some of your past not projects. Not these people. You can't, you can't guarantee that, though. You know, like, I, that's the thing. We can't just, guarantee... Just, just, you're both right. Right. The that's real issue is money. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I don't want to spend the fortune on anything, but that's just something that, that I could really argue that we need it for a zillion different reasons. What I gotta say is, if we can afford it, or it's free, great. If we can't afford it, too bad. We'll think of how to do it. We can think of how. Yeah. How. What. The option should be there. I saw it happen in Pep Squad. I've seen it happen in the industrial videos that we've made in my company. I've seen it happen in my business, in different businesses, and that is if you don't have the whole framework, if you don't have the whole budget down, and you start, okay, well, we've got to have this, and it's more than the budget, but we'll make it up somewhere else. And then we go, oh, we've got to have this, we'll make it up somewhere else. But you never make it up somewhere else. I mean, we've got to have the whole framework down. Yeah, and then that's... and say, okay, we need $2,000 for this, where are you going to take it out? This entire house is going to be a hot set for two weeks as we relocate the family, you know, right. or if this is a vacant house, we got to fill it with everything that how, okay, how does not having it affect the budget? It doesn't affect it, but we don't know if folks are going to turn, okay, you can use it, you know, but I want $1,000, things like that. Is that what you mean? Like Something like that to, hits. and what is in the house already, because Stephen's already presuming that the house is going to have everything we need in terms of what he's put in. in and that's a big blank for us. That's like, ooh. But you see, you see what I'm saying? These are the assumptions that I'm operating off because he's, he's assisting me with the break. Well, but that, that, what you're telling me then is we can't have a budget for another two weeks. I think... And we I got it. We, we, can got, we can't have a budget for anything. No, I think we can nail something pretty We can nail something. Yeah. I think but, pretty darn good. And, you know, but I'm there's going to be some holes. Be, that's a hole. Is that what you mean? That's a hole. I don't know. Well, but it's how big a hole? $1,000 holes. I don't maybe. know. Yeah, it could have been. Well, Jerry, of course you don't know. But but we do know because if it's a $10,000 hole, we can't use that house. He's the one person that I can trust that isn't apt to get me, ruin the movie, take it for himself. He wants me to do the best that I can. And I'm learning a ton by watching him go through certain administrative aspects of filmmaking that I otherwise wouldn't know. But I suppose it's just the same as running any business, and he's been great at doing that for years. And I mean this with all sincerity. Um, if Jerry's so damn smart, then how come he was selling fire extinguishers? Jonas, so damn talented and can go make all the movies in the world, how come he's surveying? If, if Steven's so damn good, then how come he's sitting at a desk and not getting his movie made? I, I can answer that. Well, <laughs> none of us has all it takes. There's not a one of us that has everything that's required to go make a movie tomorrow. Not one, I mean, no one of us has it all. What do you mean? Making a movie like any endeavor, like, like my business. I know a lot about my business, but by myself, I can't, I don't know how to weld. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know how to run the engineering stuff. I'm not an engineer. I can't design a new snowplow. I can go sell them like crazy. I can go promote them, market them. So, so it, it takes all of us. And, and what, what to me is, is I, I happen to believe that what this is really about is Stephen and Clark sitting in Kansas and JLJ sitting in California 
and we each bring a different something to the process and our real mission, should we choose to accept it, in a wonderful mission impossible sort of style, because that's about what this is, is to together form an enterprise, to together form an effort to make this friggin' movie. Well, we're doing this too quickly. First of all, we don't need any extras on July 1st. Three, everything down first? On 30th. I'm, I'm sorry, on 30th? I mean, we had two telehandle shots. Plan. I know, there's only five setups. So it doesn't matter what day we get that on, and all the people are just going to be kind of milling about. And we'll We're going to have that the first night, because it's one of the setups. We're doing all the stuff from my PDF that I sent out on the first night. Right, but the way I'm suggesting it for safety is if we do the telehandler thing both nights. <laughs> I won't have Jack in costume the second night. You're really giving us a small window. No, it's fine. It'll take 15 seconds to do that shot. Here's the situation. We have a ton of people who have responded to wanting to be in the movie. And that's these people. We have... And I have a few more, too. Right. So what we want to do is have you meet with all these people. Mm -hmm. And in your own meeting, which you can hold here in the hallway or at the Pizza Hut, wherever you prefer. <laughs> I'm Nancy, and I'm the casting director of the extras and the secondaries, and if it's too hot, just push that door open. I understand it's a little cooler outside. <laughs> Several things to run through. No red, green, or blue. He doesn't really want anything with the red stripes like you have on over there. Won't go with that. Men, t-shirts and blue jeans. Uh, hair slipped back, Elvis style or James Dean style. Uh, sundresses, and I don't have an example of that, but I did see one right here like this with the petticoat, the crinoline underneath it. Would that work? Yeah, that would work. And you need to come dressed as you're going to appear tomorrow. Hair done, everything else, ready to go. Super 35, from what I understand, uses the same thing, but the center, the, the plane that's like the center of the where the... Uh, where the lens is, is moved to take advantage of the center, more of center of, of, of the film plane, of the actual frame. When we shot in April, we didn't need to worry about this because we were shooting with a bunch of horizons. So if it's not framed in the center, it doesn't matter because you're going to move it over and you're not really going to tell because it's nothing but a horizon that's on fire. So it doesn't need to be in the center, that's not a problem. Shooting in July with Jack and everybody, if we shoot the regular 35 on a, on a camera that's not modified for Super 35 when we go into post, you're going to get one of these numbers. Here's Jack. In order to get this, we need to get a camera that's modified, and Roland's cannot be modified. This is the lens, obviously. This is a viewfinder. That's the magazine. The body is this piece right here. It's okay. the actual piece where the film through the mag goes, goes through the body, goes, goes back through the shutter, the goes back into the, the goes back up into the mag, and then here's the lens. There's okay. the, you know what I mean? Okay. That's the body. It's okay. just like a big brick. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. It's a big thing that's like like that. It's got the motor and all that stuff. Okay. Here's my question. Here's I'm I've gone a whole different place than you. Okay. In the big scheme of things. Uh, that five hundred dollars is not a huge amount, but you know, Steve. Steve has been the most difficult one as far as in terms of price goes and cost. I, I don't know. I'd say I feel like I got to justify everything because it's like Steve is. You know, I mean, this piece of paper was written on and used, but we got to find six different ways to reuse this piece of paper until it's dust. You know what I mean? And I don't know. It's just, it's difficult to try to, when you get in the mind frame. I have absolute respect for people with good, solid work ethic. I want to know that I'm working with a good, competent team that isn't looking at the clock, that isn't obsessed with how long they've been standing someplace. I'm, I'm more excited to work with a group of people that want to do it for the challenge and the experience. Ian or somebody will say speed, which means the camera's rolling. He'll pop in a little slate, he'll mark it real quick, and then I'll say call it Steve, and Steve will say action, and then that's when he starts doing his business and the camera starts doing his business. And when he says cut, I'll say cut, 
done, then they get everybody back to one, which means back to their original positions, and we'll do it again, and again, and again. You carry the two bundles of PVC pipe, Josh and Frank. Frank is carrying the lights, and there's also a couple sacks of bulbs. We're going to have two people carry Mad Marisha, and we're going to lay the blue makeup tent on top, and the three structures that are going to hold it up on top of Mad Marisha, and we're just going to carry all of when we were getting ready to shoot July, we'd shot the carnival footage. Um, I ditched Dennis Hopper, I ditched Russo, and Mike Patton still hadn't committed to playing David and Frank. So we were already into the shoot, and we had no one to play that part. It's timeless, and it's, it's magnificent. It's a masterpiece. And basically, I just get to sit around and, and be sad and distant. Um, so that it's gonna, this is going to mean something, and this is going to be one of the most brilliant things I'll ever do in my life. And that's something hard to explain, and I'm sure it's hard for anybody who even reads it to really understand. But it's true life, and it's a part of me. And it's just amazing. It was very, very easy for me to get to know Jimmy, to find out who he is and how he functions. And, um, so it was just like basically, I don't know, sort of putting him into myself. And I never, I never even dreamed about doing that with, with theater. And I don't really know, I guess I just sat down and focused, really. So it's just this nice little swaying thing, sort of like back to the two up Looking over his shoulder sort of thing? Well, we're, we're actually right now, we're getting over his Oh, we're here. Yeah. Uh, it's going correct? Camera. Rehearsal. Number 14. Everybody's natural rehearsal. All right, it's number two right here on the top front line right there, or hang on the full chain right here. Background, stand by. Nancy, this is a take. All our background. Ready? All right. Background, action. Roll camera. that you're friends with and you've grown up with. Um, everything has gone perfect in terms of like the production and, and getting things done. So everybody's wearing all these different hats, everybody's doing all these different things and with the community kind of coming together, it's, it's, it's been a joy. 
It, it was kind of fun though. We did use a few different pieces of construction equipment and things to do the stuff that we would normally do with other stuff in Los Angeles. But if you get the same effect, it shouldn't matter how you get the shot, you know. And I think that we made a lot of things work um, in town here that people may never have thought of. Hey. Get your footings. Do you know the word murder? <laughs> yes. Whenever you're upset about something, say murder. Take, have no, you cannot take, take that. And, have a take a take a piece? No. Why not? Because. Well, I wanted to. Well, people in you know, Mexico want high school. Don't light it. <laughs> it's freezing. Well, you have hardly any clothes on. You're almost naked. How would you do it? I don't have a sewing machine. Yes, you do. Who said that? <laughs> it's that long. You're gonna have to pull your arm away. This blah, 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 blah. Blah. <laughs> Can you do it? <laughs> that was my snot. Yeah. You pick your nose. I pick mine. Everybody picks their nose. Some people pick their nose and eat it. Give me that back. You said you'd leave me alone if I left you alone. Cameron, look out. Please. I have to cut it. I'll give you the leftover. Okay. Give me it! Hold on. Why are you looking at me? When Jerry judged Liz, for not having a book of drawings, it made no sense to me. Everybody wanted to hire her except Jerry. But he let us just hire her because we wanted her and he, you know, she was gonna be working with us anyway. She wasn't gonna be working with him. Mm -hmm. We said no possible, we were like, put him on a table, tape it out. <laughs> it's because we know how, how that goes when you know that it works. It works. It's difficult for me to, to gauge. Well, but like as a stage manager, I mean, I like can, a producer. I can walk into the club and say, I, can, I, can, I like color, I like stuff. Well, you know what I mean? well, right, but an administrative position, do they don't have books? Yeah, I do. Well, there are state, every I mean, stage manager has books, and she has them. Right. Here's a book. Here's a book. Here's a production book. Well, yeah, but that's what I would take. Right. You know what I mean? Right, but you don't have a portfolio. Yeah, I do. I have a reel. I have a producer's reel. With with what, whatever I've done, you know what I mean? That's what her resume is that she gave you. Yeah, I know, but I, I want to see. What else, what else do you need, though? We usually have a book, like a, a portfolio of pictures and, and But if she's never drawing. Drawings and sketches and artwork and shit like that. But she's not a designer. So she wouldn't have sketches. But she's a costume girl, right? Costume supervision is not costume design. No, she's never done that. She never designed a, a show. Or like sewn her own gown. So what, what is she going to do? Her what second is? assistant, art director. Okay, which is just... she is experienced Cataloging, management Almost of kind of like administrative kind of effect. Is it's, a, said, it's, right. a man, it's a production manager for the art department. One of the things that we needed to deprogram was the typical way that movie directors <laughs> make a movie. Typically, 
All the decision making seems to come in the editing process. Regardless of storyboards, I think most people don't do them. From my experience and from what I've heard from other people, directors walk onto the set and decide at that moment just to sort of capture everything with not a really clear idea about what they want to show. So they go in and they do what they call the master shot of the whole scene. And then they go in for coverage and, and do close-ups and, and, and then they just assemble it in a certain way in the editing room. And I just can't work that way. In my mind, the movie playing on the screen, I know exactly where every shot is, when it's cut, when, so that all the editing happens before we've ever shot a single image of, of the movie. To structure and schedule, I knew how many setups we would use, how many shots we would take for each different scene, and we could really structure it down to every 10, 15 minutes. And that was a really unusual way for them to be working. I don't think they were used to sort of that way. Like they'd say, we've got two hours to do scene 50. But you can't do that in my way of, of, of movie making because, you know, if we only had just two hours to do the scene, if I'd planned for that scene to have 35 shots, whereas somebody else might do it in two, I'd have to cut, you know, 33 shots out of the scene. And it just wouldn't be the same. Here's the gig, here's the deal. We all want to sleep too. But we're not going to be hamstrung by a bunch of rules right. that we're, we're all watching clocks and let's make a friggin' movie for Christ. Yeah, that's what we're in doing. LA, when you're really building a union, that's what a producer's well, doing. He's walking around going, Neil Pemberley's really oh, freaking out because that's the law. Yeah. Out no, uh, here, it doesn't apply to yeah, shit. Yeah. And I agree. And, and we just aren't going to allow ourselves to be hamstrung. I think, but I think they'll go with that. I think the issue is just what, what pay. I, I sure the hell hope so. But do we need to call some other people? Have you had any other I am calls or I am the only people that I think that we'd be able to, to get for the price we're offered. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying they may not be as experienced as those guys. Yeah, but these guys raised it on us again. Yeah, I know they did. I'm not now I'm not too particularly thrilled about it anymore because of that. You know, I gotta be honest, I'm like well, if these guys are going to be playing games with me, yeah, I don't want to. What, has Jonah said anything about uh, it? I haven't talked to Jonah yet, but I'm going to. See, the thing is, with Jonah, Jonah's not going to tell me too much. He's not going to offer too much. He's going to say, well, dude, I don't know, dude. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, basically. And he doesn't have any other names. Ours, huh? He doesn't have any other names. And, and I think that that's what's lost in Hollywood, seriously. I, th I think in Hollywood, it's more of a status thing. And, but a, an independent movie maker, they really strive to do everything that they can to make the best film that they can. I basically worked a full-time job. I managed a store. I'm a personal trainer. I put things on hold to do this. And uh, granted, my pay, you know, I, I, I didn't get paid very much of anything. But that's because I really wanted to do this. It, it was a desire to do it. It was a challenge. And, and I think that uh, when, when people are challenged, you'll see them at their best. And I really don't think that in a, in a huge Hollywood movie that people are challenged enough. The money's there, so they do what they, they want to do. Oh yeah, well that's because that's we drive past their house all the time and that's how we uh, came across your car. You know what, that's definitely an option because there are a couple scenes where there's a passing car that honks and you know, you're more than welcome to do it. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, um, one a.m. Where's the third boob? It's in there. Pleasant running around naked with her three boobs. Not only did I get to see that, she actually, as, as I was preparing for my part, they were doing my hair and my makeup and all that, she comes up to me and flashes me and then her boob falls off into my lap. So, you know, I'm sitting there and I didn't know what to say because it just, number one, three boobs right in front of me and then one falls off. It was just crazy. She's crazy anyway, so it was funny. <laughs>
this trailer, for the amount of time and effort that was put into this thing, it might be in, let's see, the exterior, maybe 15 minutes worth, if that. It might not even be that. So, you know, four months of work for a few minutes. The interior for this trailer is over in stage one, and we had two uh, guys come up from Nebraska, Dave and Aaron Tidwell, and they built the entire structure and the walls, and they built a, um, a roof that's suspendable and go up and down, move side to side if you want. And we made the roof, the interior, just like this, but it's bigger loops. The windows were uh, donated to us. A lot of it we got for free. There was a lot of donated material, so it cut costs down quite a bit. finally happening. It's kind of neat to see the trailer here in the park. I think Karen Black is very difficult. Um, she, she definitely can pull off any role, but she is very difficult to deal with, uh, whether it be getting, getting her onto the set, getting her there in time, because basically she's on her time. And so you have to work with her in many you know, respects. You have to be firm with her but to get her to the set, get her there in costume, get her there on time. Well, we are pulling this just to see. Just to see what this material does. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Um, we don't know what we're doing exactly because we're really, really searching and looking. This one you just... And this is just like with. bizarre. <laughs> and Fine. we don't know what it'll do, but it's, it looks like a costume that piss someone in, in a carnival would wear to me. Sure. And this I mean, one? in a circus. We are going just to see. And this we're just going to see what happens with taffeta around the waist and so forth, and it might All just right. work somehow. And we're just solving problems, one way or another, different permutations of how to solve this certain problems. Karen has a very unique taste. It's not bad, but it's what I call cutesy. So a lot of the time, when I picked you know, all these things for her to wear as Sandra. She'd have a different idea about how to go with it, aesthetically. Getting her to just wear what I asked her to wear was kind of like pulling teeth. She wanted to change all the designs. She wanted to split them up. She wanted to make them how she saw Sandra. But the truth was, it was not her vision. When she came, to Kansas to try out all her costumes that we pulled for her. She basically picked out a whole new set of costumes for Eleanor because I wanted Karen Black to be presented in a way that she hasn't been for 20 years. I knew that we needed to do some tricks and I had her get together with Jonah and Linda, the makeup artist in LA, and take a series of photographs, trying out different lipsticks, uh, different hairstyles, a different light. We went all the way around her face with different angles of light to see how she photographed from certain directions. Because her face is very strange. It's almost like a cat or a wild animal. And, you know, I, I wanted to take advantage of her features instead of having them play against us. So we did, I guess, a minor screen test for Karen. And uh, we tried red lipstick, pink lipstick, dark eyebrows, no eyebrows, light eyebrows, heavy black makeup, not so much black makeup, Rosy cheeks, not rosy cheeks, pale skin, tan skin. We went through the whole nine yards and we found a Karen that really looks like Madonna in some frames. And when I saw those images, I thought, damn, she hasn't aged a bit. So we took those tricks and we applied them to the film for when she was playing Sandra. When she was playing the mother, I wanted her to look absolutely the opposite. Mike was really, really easygoing. He was awesome, very professional. Um, I'd say bring these up. No chaos at all. It was just he was great. Yeah, just about here. So shorten these, like probably an inch. Here, put your arm down again. Yeah, it's right here. Should I just pin that there too? Is that the bat that's gonna crack my skull? Yeah. Although my <clears throat> my morning started out pretty amazing, I met day one. I met the mortician. Where? The mortician of Womego.
In the in the hotel, he's friends with the. Uh, he's just hanging out. <laughs> How ridiculous! They were asking me some questions. Oh, you play music and blah blah blah. So we're talking. They go, "Don't ask him what he does for a living." And I was, "What? Oh, I'm a I'm a mortician." Wow! <laughs> so I'm trying to weasel my way into. It's like, oh sure, I'll I call I'd call you up in the middle of the night if we get a death call. Or I was, oh my god! Count me in. There were many reasons for me to do this. You know, first of all, why the fuck not? Second of all, it was bizarre on a lot of levels. <laughs> Coming to Kansas for a month, <laughs> maybe that should have scared me away, but it, it, it attracted me, you know? Um, doing something I'd never done before, being in an unfamiliar environment where I wasn't comfortable, where I didn't know where to go, and where I wasn't in control. But you know what? Unless you're willing to take risks, you're not going to learn anything, and you're not really going to go anywhere, and you're not going to grow, and, you know, you're going to be miserable. My impression of, of Mike was that he has a lot of freedom. He's a, a, an impassioned sort of actor, and he, he fills uh, his character and the, and the space around him with a lot, a lot of energy, and, and, and he's free, he's very free. I must say he made some of the loudest noises I have ever heard on any movie I've ever made. This man's vocal apparatus is like, you know, he could be God. Yeah. Well, how was I today, God? You were not okay. Well, when I go out drinking, I get hammered. However they get there, the easy up outside, just rent another easy up or something. Or get another easy up for it, you know what I mean? Because if I have them here, then there could be pressure there. Correct, correct. And Steven can work with them, so he's not sitting. And he turns okay, so, around. So we're not doing the show me and all that whole uh -huh. stuff. Right, Partying. right. So what about the trailers then? Are these just for touch-ups? No, these are for, they should be on the set actually. To be honest with you. But this thing right here, It doesn't look like I'm doing anything, but the truth is, we are, there's nothing to do until it gets darker. I was just going to say, if worse comes to worse, I'll use a piece of that too. I just don't want the, um, the right. bad part to stop poking up. I can, I'll find a safety. I'm not getting your head and stop at that. No, Paul, I'm not. Don't waste your time on me. Everyone that I've met on the set is wonderful, and um, everyone works really well together. And as far as, 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 far as um, filming or sets go, it's, it's been the loosest set in the sense that everyone, you know, there, there's no ego trips and no, um, you know, no one's like putting on airs or, you know, there's not a lot of like, you know, assistant directors or production assistants running around with a clipboard trying to be all really important. I mean, everyone is just like trying to facilitate the movie filming running smoothly. So that, that's just been great. <laughs> as soon as the lighting is perfect, we'll perfect. just do it. Ready to go. Okay, I just want you to know. Oh, thank you. Here. I, don't, I wanted you to know the same, my friend. Well, good. Isn't that nice? Hey, Steve. You're welcome. From the beginning, I wanted Karen to do it because I know what she is capable of doing. And for the last 10 years, I don't think she's been used to her 
full capacity. I think people have been putting her in roles that are cheap or small. I think that, you know, she's incredible looking. And most often, people want her to be scary or, you know, sort of to cause fear in the audience. I wanted to show her beautiful. I wanted to show her as a powerful performer. I think it's been a very good experience. It's a different way of working than I'm used to. Some of the coverage that we're doing and things like this are not, you know, not they're not standard, but they're a little bit different than the way I've been, I was trained. So um, for the first week or so, it was a little bit more difficult for me because you go in there and you're going to shoot a scene and then you're going to do certain shots. But Stephen always has this vision, or he's had his vision for about five years of how he was going to cut the entire movie together. So you have to trust that he knows exactly what he needs and, and give him just that because he's the director, you know. And that's, that's basically one thing that you, I was trained in school was that, you know, you can make suggestions and you can, you can give your opinion, you know, but you need to trust the director because it's their... It's their vision of how they're going to put it together and, you know, when Stephen would say which shot we were doing or what type of coverage, basically I would kind of line it up to where I thought where he wanted it and then he would dial it into exactly what he wanted and then we just went from there. He reminds me of Hitchcock. You know, Hitchcock was very playful but very exacting. Very playful. Hitchcock was a big toddler. He loved to fool people and trick people and he, he was... He was great. He was like shrewd, but playing games all the time. Incredible combination. Stephen, if he, if he likes it, and, he, and he's looking at what he just got, and he can't imagine anything better, and it's exactly what he would have wanted, and he just says, okay. And he doesn't get a cover shot. He doesn't do it again. He doesn't try to get two of them. Because he has it, and it's very interesting, because I've sort of never heard of that. I mean, even if they loved it, they get a second one. So it's interesting he'll move along. It's very lighthearted of him. Confident, like some, like someone playing a, a, a happy game, you know, something fun, lighthearted that you, you love. He's definitely unlike anyone else I've ever met. Uh, he's really, he's definitely, he's genius, obviously. Um, and this whole thing is a work of genius. Um, it really amazes me, actually, how, how he, he, sort of, he approaches things with like this, this, this childish exuberance. <laughs> Don't get caught up in your emotions. <laughs> Laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Just laugh, laugh about it. Elijah, any question? Did we finish early today? Don't ask for any more at this time. <laughs> <laughs> and he giggles a lot, you know. Oh, he giggles in a high voice. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, so you feel that you're embraced by him, you feel that he's, you're taken care of, that he understands very well what you're doing, what you're uh, offering, uh, and at the same time, um, it's light, so that it's serious, it's heartfelt, it's, it's as moving as it can be, but it's light, it never grinds. Is Joe sterile? No, I don't Count to ten, ask again. Two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's Joe Sterl. Related issues may surface. <laughs> he made me feel really comfortable about the idea of even thinking about it, even entertaining the idea. And I would be here if he wouldn't have twisted my arm, both of my arms, several times in a very clever way that didn't hurt me. <laughs> the biggest surprise was probably how make-believe it all is that it's illusion more than reality. And I think when I read the script, I was thinking, and when, you know, I actually, Steve convinced me and made me feel comfortable in, in taking these roles, I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, I get to smack a lot of people around, I get to die a couple times, I get to rape somebody, my goodness, this, this is all great, but how the hell am I gonna do that, you know? I saw in my mind, you know, I'm gonna have to hit people and, you know, 
I didn't realize that how much of it was really delusion. Stepping back and looking through the camera eye, every time I had a question, Steve would go, look. And I'd look through it and go, oh. He's so used to these visions of his and these colors and these juxtaposition of form. It's so vivid in his, in his spirit. So he's, he's, in that sense, he's like Hitchcock, because a lot of the movie is already in him, and he's not, he's not uh, sorting about finding it or having to think about things in, in, a, in a heavy way. So he's lighthearted, and it's been fabulous working with him. No. Just give us a click. Karen is a genius. She is these people when she's performing. So I think because it's so incredible, it was worth every second of having to deal with her. I think the hardest working crew member was Linda, the makeup artist. She was incredible. She got there the earliest. She was the first working every day. She was the last to go every night after days and weeks. She had to have been pulling 16 or 17 hour days every day. I know how physically exhausting that can be. So when she would have a breakdown of sorts and just get sort of flustered with the lack of just rest that she needed, it was totally understandable. I mean, I didn't blame her for... Steven, I'm not in there for more than five minutes with people banging on my door saying, we need you on set. I don't know what to do. I'm on set, you're in the way. We can't, we have you in here, we're shooting in here. No, move over here. No, we can't have you here, we're shooting here. Well, here's what I told Joe. As long as people come made up or dressed, when we need them, it can be anywhere. It can be on the roof, it can be on the lawn, it can be anywhere. She does need to take a look at me before I get on the set so that I don't have my like, room. Yeah. The first like, line is hand me your plate, so his right. plate is not already done. Not so it's now, no. here's She's your plate. I was so excited to be able to work with Karen Black. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I just, I, I was kind of borderline obsessed with her. I mean, not, I don't mean obsessed, but I just was like, I just, I would see her in movies and I'd be thinking like, that woman is really interesting. She kind of just, you know, I remember in The Great Gatsby and Five Easy Pieces. She was in The Day of the Locust. And I remember I was so excited that, uh, you know, uh, Nathaniel West's story was being made into a movie. And then she was the actress in it and it kind of, I just sort of, I think I wanted to be her for a little bit. <laughs> but watching her act uh, up close, uh, it, I, I, it's incredible. I mean, I feel like the first day I saw her, I didn't really have to do much in a scene. I just, I think I stopped by the set one day and she was working. And I just thought, oh shit, this is like watching Geraldine Page on stage. I'd never seen Karen Black work up in person. I'd never seen her in a play, you know, or it's like watching Geraldine Page or you know, Vanessa Redgrave. I mean, it's neither of them. It's to Karen is like very different from everybody. But it just had the depth. I mean, when she just, I mean, her, her, everything she's doing goes through every ounce of her body. There is nothing that is not connected to what she's doing. So much so that one day we were doing a scene together and we were walking into Jimmy's room and she suddenly like, she was right in front of me and she went into a complete slouch. I thought, oh my God, man, this lady is so unbelievably connected. The pain of going into this kid's room is just affecting her that she can't even stand up straight anymore. And then she turned around at me and she goes, are we supposed to go this way or that way? And I thought, oh, that was just Karen stopping to ask her. She was frustrated she didn't know the question. But she's like that good that you're just, you know, you want to see what, what her toes are doing while she's acting because everything is a part of it. And it's just alive and intricate and beautiful. I'd like to have like a little close up on every single thing she's doing all day long. She's 3.30 care ready. She's still watching the video. And then she while there, she's getting hair done makeup. But now she's coming makeup ready. So she'll be here at 3.45, maybe, maybe makeup ready. Depending on what time we're done, maybe tonight, I don't know, this morning. She's she'll be just watching the game again. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully. Well, my thing is, who told Linda to not have hair at 3.30? Michael, I'm not sure, but I'll miss an hour. Well, we I did. I, okay. I was one of the people who did that because yep, we sure told her to have it here at 3.30, but with hair done, yes, and then they would be shooting this. Pretty close, Because yeah. we thought Ed and Harry were needed first, yeah. and right. then uh, while they were shooting eight, this scene, then she could well, finish off the makeup. Right. So, so that, she, that would be my she going to be here at 3.30? She's going to be here at 3.45, right. which I just said, makeup ready. 
Okie doke. So we can't yell at her because you're nice. Damn she it, fax Jen. To you. We were going to yell at Linda. It's not her fault. I know. It's not that's the fault. problem. It was, <laughs> you know, Ed and Harry, okay. we assumed, and that was our fault because it right. was an establishing shot, but it said characters needed Ed and Harry. Right. So we wanted them makeup ready first. Patricia right. wasn't needed until the next scene, so we were going to give right. her makeup time right. to finish it off when she got here. So, I, no, I it makes sense. I'll take the blame for that because... I know, but I don't have the heart to yell at you. <laughs> Clark! Clark! <laughs> Jeez. Hello! You say, wait, Ed, I want to buy a paper, and... No, way down here. I get yeah, but you didn't do that part. <laughs> We've created a nice relationship. So, after every couple of seconds, she turns... That's it. He's not turning. And he's going to be going to get a paper. A lot of it is self-reliance, where you thought you were going to have help in the beginning, because mm -hmm. you're not, mm -hmm. you know, and I experienced all these people saying, how can I help, how can I help, when... I don't know how, no. Well, no one was, uh -huh. you know, you sit there and say, how can I help, and then I say, and then nobody would do anything. Yeah. And I finally got to the point several times with certain people where I flat out told them, you know, don't ask me anymore. Because obviously you don't care or don't have the time. And that's part of the reason why I've lost respect for some people. Just because, you know, if you're going to be there to help, then really be there to help. The hours are crazy. Uh, one minute you work from 5 in the morning to 5 in the evening. Uh, next you'd work from, you know, 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning. Um, there was, there was uh, evenings that were just freaking cold. But it, it was really worth it. You know, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, it was long. But like I said, it's a challenge, and, and that was all the fun. I love filming on location. It's really great because everything's real, and the buildings are real, and the light and the space are real, and the architecture is real. It's just, it's terrific. I'm not a lazy person by nature. Mm -hmm. I like to do stuff constantly. Mm -hmm. I like to work for what I want. When we were on the set, and there was a C-stand that needed to be moved, mm -hmm. I would want to move it. But if I moved it, the crew would take it as an insult because the director is supposed to sit on his fat ass and not do anything. And that's just stupid. You know, I, I can move a goddamn C-stand. I'm not an invalid, you know? So when I, I would, a couple of days I did this and nobody knew because I had to wait till everybody was gone. But I would sit there and I would look around and make sure none of the crew was there. And then I'd grab that C-stand and move it over to the side of the house and set it down and run back to my station. And, you know, I just, I had such a great time moving their equipment around without them noticing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kathleen Wilhoyt, she was really funny on the set. Uh, the shooting that day was crazy because it was rainy, it was cloudy, and then it was sunny, and then it was kind of a mess, but she handled it well. Everybody did handle it really well. That day was, was very stressful because uh, I get the call that the first AD is sick, and all of a sudden I'm put in the the position to rally everybody together and I'm thinking okay how am I gonna do this so I'm nervous you know I'm rallying everybody together we're moving from one side to the next side and it's raining and and it's kind of chaotic and then we're gonna go into this guy's house and we got to make sure his white carpet uh, doesn't get mud on it so we're scrambling for blankets and getting everything prepared the most incredible person that I worked with on the entire film was Brooke because she's the easiest most gifted actor I've ever worked with. Yes, she's my sister, but she can move through a sentence five different ways, with five different emotions, with a snap of the finger. She doesn't bring around the baggage. She doesn't give a shit about all those phony things, you know, costume, hair, makeup. She does her job. Souvenir. 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 And, and maybe it's just because, you know, we're so familiar with each other because we've been working together, essentially, since we were children. Souvenir? You know, and we've known each other every day of our lives, always. That it, it takes very little to communicate. It's sort of that same relationship that I have with Rhett, who was going to be the DP. It's just a lot of, you know, few words, just a few little things, but we get each other all the way. Yeah, yeah. 
took us 12 hours to film uh, the bed sheet scene with the clothesline, which is one of my favorites. And then it actually took four hours on a different day to film the rest of that scene. So actually that scene took about 14 hours to film on two different days, weeks apart. Hold it higher. Roll it. Higher more. More. I just feel like that, that, that this movie, um, you know, the, the relationship that the, the son was the writer and the director of this, and his father was the producer of it, and his sister was an actress in it. And I just feel like it's really lucky that you kind of just made it the way you did on your own. I feel like, I feel like it's really such a, a gift that you can be in the place that you come from and the place that you know and the place that you're comfortable and use all, um, you know, everything you know about that place and everything you have a connection to in that place. All of it, not to leave here, not to have somebody come in here and tell you what to do. You know, is the director really getting to do it his way or not? But that's really what, uh, you know, is, I, I feel like, it, you know, probably one of the great joys of filmmaking. And if you can execute that, you're really lucky, and, you know, and smart. <laughs> Undertaking a, a, the production of a motion picture is, is not something to do light, lightly. Uh, but I think that we are proof that it can be done. All of us have dreams. When we're little kids, we have dreams. Somehow, somewhere, I don't know whether it's society, the schools, what, begins telling us, oh, you can't achieve those dreams. You, you, be reasonable. You, you can't be a pro ball player. Be reasonable. You can't be an Olympic athlete. Be reasonable. You can't be a world famous artist. And, and so I think a lot of us put our dreams on the shelves and, and we go on about living sort of a mundane, humdrum life. Always wondering, always that nagging doubt, could I have fill in the blank? And, and I'd like to think that, that Stephen pursuing his filmmaking and, and us together producing and delivering this film is, is sort of proof you, you can be in the middle of a small town in Kansas and have a dream and you can figure out a way to do it. I think this, this needs to be encouragement to everybody everywhere to find out what your dreams are and go for it with gusto. Far away from Hollywood Where I left my name On the walk of fame with a sharpie